that I know we can, I can stay creative and I, I'm going to stay optimistic and I'm going to stay positive and I'm going to try my hardest to um, adapt and be flexible and not be scared of change. So that's stuff that, that's been reinforced for me this year. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Embracing change and being flexible enough to navigate uncertain landscape has been vital during this time. Operators have had to rethink their business to survive. But as we move forward, some are sticking to the new formulas, the new way of doing business and its netting surprising results. Darren Purchase is the owner of Birch and Purchase. Darren, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Mate, it's great to um, hear your voice. It's been a um, pretty pretty crazy <laughs> year, hasn't it? Um, Melbourne's just opened up the last couple of weeks. How does it feel there at the moment? It, it, do you know what? Melbourne feels amazing at the moment. Um, thankfully, the weather's awesome, but there's a there's an air around town of, you know, positivity and, um, I don't know, get, I guess, you know, getting through the dark times that um, that people have had. There, there is there is like an air of um yeah positivity obviously not everyone's through it and it, it has not been easy but there it, it just it's a little yeah. bit easier now for for certain people and um i think with customers and and operators you can you can feel a sense of optimism we've seen a lot of operators pivot and change what they're offering is to survive but you had a dramatic change with your offering can you take us through uh, what what you did um, I guess you know I've I've always had a unique business. Um, I never wanted to follow the traditional route of um, opening a restaurant. Um, I love uh, my craft and I love my industry, but I wanted to do things kind of my way. I also never wanted to um, follow the tried and trest, uh, tested, open one shop and then open another and then open another. I've always felt, and my wife is the same. My wife, Kath. Um, we work in the business together. We've always felt that um, we want this business to be um, personal and um, extremely high quality and not something that um, is, you know, a rollout. So um, I guess we're we're always, we've been working um, hard at, on our business for 10 years and um, we've had, you know, many highs and many lows, many peaks and troughs as, as businesses do. Um, and kind of when this, when this hit this year, this uh, COVID um, situation, we were in. We were almost ready for COVID before COVID hit. And if that sounds a bit uh, strange, we were. Yeah, well, we were on Chapel Street, and we've got. If anyone knows, we've got um, quite a small shop, um, Chapel Street North. Um, some construction started right next door to us four years ago, um, and they said, uh, you know, this is going to impact and. It was um it the shop next door was a small uh, mattress or bed shop, and it got approved um for nineteen story high apartment block and it, it was literally attached to our shop. So for the last four years we've um we've had to really sort of rein in our business and try and protect what we had and try and weather the storm. So when 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 COVID hit. We were kind of ready for it because the impact of the construction next door was so severe on our business. We'd gone from 23 employees in that business down to seven. Um, and really, Kath and I were um, just, just like I say, trying to weather the storm and trying to um, fight to survive. And uh, in doing that, we put ourselves in a situation where, you know, a, a small business operators, you kind of do a lot yourself and try and do it all yourself. And we we'd worked ourselves into a situation where we were working uh, where the shop was open seven days a week. And certainly the shop is never um, open when Kath and I are not there. Um, so we were working every day and I'm in the kitchen making stuff and packing stuff and Kath's out the front, um, uh, you know, taking orders and running the shop front. And we were kind of, well, number one, we were exhausted. Number two, we were, um, you know, we were a little bit, uh, disheartened i guess that the that the state of the construction next door was really impacting us so when covid hit we we were number one we didn't um we didn't immediately panic 
um, because we kind of felt like we'd been through really dramatic, impactful changes in our business before. And then number two, um, I kind of, um, we, we looked at the landscape and looked what was going on and, and um, as restrictions came down in the first lockdown, we suddenly realised that we could continue to operate because we were essentially a retail shop which was doing takeaway food, which was deemed essential. So um, we, yeah, we we kind of carried on and we were we we managed to keep our core team and we've been open throughout the whole of the COVID pandemic. Um, even the construction next door has been finished, which is hilarious, um, because because just as it's finished, we've we've now decided to, um, I guess, carry on lots of the practices that we put in place during um, during the two lockdowns, and we've decided that they are actually working for us better. Um, and we're really we yeah, I know it's strange. You know, you're on a hamster wheel, you're running around, you think you you think you're doing great things but you're probably not actually doing yourself the best service when you're working every single day. And um, it it was one of those situations where if we'd have made the changes then that we've made now, our customers probably would have got really upset with us. Um, And also we probably wouldn't have had the courage to, to make such dramatic changes. So in a, in a perverse way for us, and I'm, I'm sure for a lot of operators out there, um, this this COVID situation this year has ultimately um, brought us to what we think is a better place. Although, you know, it's been hard financially for us. We're extremely lucky that we've been able to trade through. You know, we're not making millions of dollars or anything, but we've managed to keep our core team and we've all stayed employed and we've all learned new things with, with restrictions and we've, we've all um, learned new skills with um, changing some of our product range to suit, you know, what was appropriate at the time. People were wanting less sort of fancy cakes and more, you know, homely stuff. So we were making crumbles and focaccias and, um, you know, just, yeah, it was, but it was, it was sort of awesome in a way. We were, we've got a really awesome, loyal band of um, customers and followers who supported us throughout and used our drive through round the back um, to sort of place orders and then pick up. Um, and, you know, the, the drive through we've had round the back since day one, um, 10 years ago. Uh, and it's always been handy, um, but it really sort of came, came to the fore um, during this situation because um, the construction had stopped next door as well. So we were able to use our drive through for the first time in about four years. Um, and it's been working really well. And, you know, subsequently, um, we've gone from a retail store, um, which uh, which used to have, you know, you walk in, you had amazing edible artwork on the wall, you had a sweet soundtrack with, you know, four hundred dessert songs on there. The stocks, uh, the shelves were stocked full of amazing products, sort of non-perishable on that side, homemade jams, chocolates, and then the um, the real sort of hero i guess was the four meter long cake cabinet of which for the last 10 years i've personally put out myself you know the team have finished things in the morning we've and we've like really gone nuts and made what we thought was the best sort of um you know one of the best pastry showcases in in melbourne we were really proud of the fact that everything was super fresh uh and we would we would produce this amazing cake cabinet which would take us hours um and you know a lot of the time we would we would sell or we would sell very well we you know we like i say we've got some awesome customers but um just in the last four years anything can happen um if 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 the construction impact has impacted us such that uh you know a truck might stop in front of our shop um all day we we could literally throw away that cake cabinet you know everything's gone in the bin so, um, you know, the first sort of five years of Birch and Purchase, we were, you know, we were a little bit sort of, I don't know, I guess in vogue, you know, a bit trendy and we were really popular, um, you know, and then the last five years you go through different cycles where, you know, you have your core customers and people know what you do. And, um, but there are other sort of new exciting things happening around town or in, or in Australia. So, you know, people gravitate towards them. So we were in this situation where, um, 
you know, we we could be throwing a whole cake cabinet away every single every single day, and you know, spending hours setting it up. Um, so when COVID hit, and we were forced um, through social distancing to you know not have too many people in the shop, we decided to um, stop the cake cabinet um, for a while, and then put everything online. We already had an online store, um, so. Um, we, it was just a matter of, you know, adding a few more products and putting everything online and then using click and collect or the drive through around the back. And do you know what? It's working better for us. And we're really, we're really excited for the future. We're, we're sad for some of our customers because we're still trying to get the message across that, um, we're going completely online and all of the, uh, yeah, all of the changes that we made, in the last sort of you know few months, we're going to probably continue those um, because they work better for us, and we believe they're going to work better for our customers as well. Um, and certainly, there's a lot of people that don't want to um, browse shops too long these days. You know, they've got they have to wear face masks, and it's you know uncomfortable when you're you know with other people sometimes, especially food businesses. And um, and for, from our point of view, we can actually replicate that beautiful cake shop um virtually we can do it online so um you know we can have we've always invested heavily in uh, food photography we've got a regular uh, guy called Ari who's been with us for about six years and um we always get awesome pictures of our food so that's all online now um all of the um beautiful stuff is online but my team and I don't I guess I'm not going to say waste, but I don't spend hours setting up a cake cabinet in the morning in the hope that you're going to sell it. Um, it's basically there online. So there's no waste. I can even have a bigger menu and I've always had lots of lots and lots and lots of products. So I've got even more now because, um, the orders come in and we, you know, we, um, get the orders together and all work out as a team, how we're going to attack it next day. And then we make everything to order, um, based on the components that we have, um, ready to go you know we glaze in the morning we spray chocolate in the morning finish cakes and we make tarts and we do all those things but basically we're just making the orders that have come in it's like it's like eureka moment you know whereas before i would make you know i'm guessing i will go oh well you know it's quite warm today um it doesn't look like there's any construction on the street we know there's a public holiday you know you're kind of guessing not I'll make 40 lemon tart, um, I'll do 30 of them, I'll do 20 of them. And it really was a guessing game. And we did get quite good at not um, not overproducing. Um, we never wanted to run out. We didn't want to be that shop that um, you go to at midday and they sort of, they look down their nose at you like, are you crazy? You're coming here at 12 o'clock. Well, of course we sold out. We, you know, we, all, we always had... Um, quite a lot of trade for people coming uh, to see us after work because we stayed open until half past six. So they would pick up stuff. Um, we wanted them to pick up stuff on their way home from work. Um, so, But now there's no guessing involved. So they can still choose the time they want to pick up. They can choose from a larger menu. I can um, be more creative because I'm not I haven't spent you know, the first four hours of my day setting up that cake cabinet. Um, so there's more time for me and for my wife to work on the business as well as in the business. Um, and yeah, there's no waste at all. So we're literally making to order. So that was, that was a change that, um, we would probably love to have made, but probably wouldn't have had the courage to do because it's a really dramatic, um, change from, you know, where, where we first started and, before COVID, it was ex- you know it's expected that you can just sort of walk into a shop and choose whatever you want, have whatever you want, stay for as long as you want, and then you know and then go. But now our customers, because of what's happened, um, they they all completely understand where we're coming from. And they you know when they come in um, and they say, oh you know, um, are you going to go back to are you going to go back to normal? Um, we sort of say, you know, that this is the new normal now. Um, and we're probably not going to go back to it because um, we explain exactly what I've just said to you. And they all go, yeah, right, we get it. You know, I get it now. Yeah, I totally understand. Um, you know, they're all recounting stories of, you know, booking restaurants up the road and um, getting a, a window that they have to, they have to sit down, you know, to our window and they have to put deposits down. And I think all of these things 
are really great things and they're they're things that um people will you know would would have been really against at the start of the year uh, but now that everyone completely understands so in using the covid situation to change your business like what what advantages are there to this new business model um there's you know there's there's so many advantages to using um this new new business model um it's not just in the data day-to-day operation of our business which has changed you know really dramatically you know, before it was a retail store walk in um, buy what you want now it's completely online um, you can come in the front of the shop um, but it's purely for pickup um, so that's a dramatic change but also changing the business helps from um, I guess the bigger picture type thing so for example we used to run it seven days a week and, you know, Kath and I would get in there. We're always in there, at, you know, sometimes five, four or five o'clock in the morning and we're there till late. We're there till everyone else has gone home and you, you're, you're physically exhausted, but you're also mentally exhausted. You're trying to um, – I'm trying to be creative, but we're also trying to run the business as well at the same time. There's always lots of things and we're, we end up responding to sort of uh, – um, emails or requests really late at night when you're kind of not you know you're not that into it because you you're really sort of tired and you know you got to get up next morning but this covid all of a sudden forced us to um we had to consolidate our team so we we said right we're, we're going to run five days now so we can just have our team on we're not going to work a seven day roster we can have our team on five days and then we can keep that core crew um, employed throughout the whole of it so we'll close sort of Sunday Monday so um, all of a sudden we had Kath and I were we had two days where we didn't have to get in really early and set it all up and and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm responding to emails you know um, Kath's getting a bit further ahead on her admin we're actually sort of getting getting stuff done and then um, so it kind of helps you with the business as well as a, you know, for a vision, you know, where do we want to take this? You know, all of a sudden we're off this hamster wheel of working every single day. Um, it gives you a bit more time to think. So, and then you can kind of plan and, and reassess and go, right, well, we've been doing this for 10 years, you know, we've built up an awesome reputation. We've got great customers. Um, we're not getting any younger. We can't, you know, <laughs> we don't want to be standing behind a cake cabinet for the rest of our lives, you know, um, with with a very basic till and and chatting to customers although that's awesome we want to sort of kind of move on and progress and take our business to the next level but not in the sense of opening hundreds of shops we want to um, take it somewhere else so not working those seven days gave us a bit of time to kind of work out where we wanted to take the business how we wanted to um, move forward with the business where we could see ourselves in another 10 years um, and that's been really helpful. Um, also, you know, I started um, filming content like a lot of chefs did and um, doing some sort of home stuff because, you know, everyone was doing it. So let's let's film some content at home and let's get some stuff out there. And, and I was able to do that because we weren't in physically in our business on that sort, sort of Sunday, Monday. And then from that, I, all sorts of other opportunities came about and I learned lots of things about um, I, I guess editing videos editing audio files I'm quite technically you know competent but I'm no I'm no Steve Jobs <laughs> but um, but I can work I can work out how to do it but you know I, I could all of a sudden produce my own sort of um, cooking segment and and that led to um, other external work um, from from people wanting content from chefs so I was able to produce that and I was able to supply that and that was another um, revenue stream coming into the business that um, during COVID which is very helpful but also a revenue stream that I wouldn't have had um, had had it all not happened because I uh, number one I wouldn't have been in the situation to answer those emails requesting that information because I was so busy but I also wouldn't probably wouldn't have been competent enough to um, to know how to produce and submit all of that um, content, and subsequently, I've done I've done lots of sort of freelance um, video content work um, for brands or f- you know for my own brand as well, um, and that's been and that's that's led to other 
exciting, I don't know, I guess sort of, you know, avenues. And, you know, there's lots of things that are going to happen in 2021 um, that are a result of, you know, that sort of home content production that, that Kath and I were doing. You're renowned as one of the best pastry chefs in the country. Where, where did it all start for you? Oh, <laughs> where did it all start? Just a long time ago now. Um, it's very flattering that, you know, I, um, I don't consider myself one of the best. I know there's a whole heap of really talented people out in, um, in Melbourne and Australia, and I, I'm constantly, like, amazed by the creativity and some of the things that I see um, – in this country it really is it's awesome and i feel really blessed to live in uh well live in australia but live in melbourne melbourne's a really sort of creative place um so i to to be spoken of in that way um is very humbling for me because um uh i guess i came i came from obviously i came from the uk um i'd met you know my wife in brisbane and and then i moved to australia and i was kind of blown away when i came over here because i I just assumed that um, the be all and end all of the world was everything that I saw in the UK. And, um, you know, I realise now how little food knowledge I had till I came to Australia and, you know, some of the ingredients I, I see. Um, but I guess, you know, I started, um, I left school. I didn't really know what to do. Um, I was quite sporty. I, this is cutting a long story short. I just, I went travelling to Europe. I had started washing up. I have uh, fell into a kitchen, started cooking, and then decided that I really wanted to do it. So um, I, I, my parents don't live too far from London, so I got a job in London at the Savoy Hotel um, and managed to, I think um, on, my, on the open day, they were looking for chefs. I went to an open day, and the, the chef there demonstrated how to make peach melba and not only did he do that, he told he, he sort of recounted the story of how it was invented at the Savoy by Escoffier for Dame Nelly Melba. And already I've got an Australian connection there for the future that I didn't know um, was going to come in handy. But um, I was just blown away by the, the history of it and, you know, the story behind it. And I just kind of fell in love with the whole thing. And I just thought, take get me in there now, get me in the pastry, I want to do all that stuff. Um, and I just, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a hard worker, so I was always there and I would work my days off and I'd do everything. I didn't really have a hell of a lot going on <laughs> um, other than that. There was sort of football at the weekend, but, um, yeah, I would just work. I work, 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 work. I, you know, I worked in the bakery department, worked in all different um, sections of the pastry department, and there was – a lot of different sections in the pastry department then we're talking um there was over 120 probably about 135 chefs at the savoy when i was working there yeah it was it was huge but it was awesome um it was obviously um quite i won't say brutal kitchen you know it, like it was hard work and there was a lot of you know yelling and stuff like that but i was just thought it was normal and i'm quite um a, a i don't know strong personality and I can handle myself in situations so I was I I cope pretty well and I loved it I loved the buzz um I worked in the restaurant as well as in the main pastry production um I worked in the tourier department so I would like basically turning all the puff pastry and making um all, all the paste and making tart shells and cheese straws and I worked in the ice cream department chocolate department pet four department <laughs> um everywhere Everywhere, really. It was awesome. Um, and they used to have – I was quite competitive. They had Chef of the Month competition, and I was just trying to win it every single month. And I, <laughs> I think that I annoyed everyone because I would win it a lot, and I would get to go up to Chef's office, um, and he had, he had this big office overlooking the main, um, the main kitchen, and I, he would just say, you know, I'll oh, just choose something – you know, and he would have cookbooks or he would have something in his office, like a plate, and I would just grab it as my prize and get him to sign it. And I've got all these, <laughs> I've got all these, I've got all these bits that I've kept throughout my career. Um, but I, I loved it. It was, it was awesome. Um, I was at the Savoy for over three years, um, and I just, I learned so much there about, you know. Um, classic dishes and the history of dishes and I think all of that stuff really um, 
hold you in good stead for the future. You know, that, um, I think if you know, if you know some of the, where stuff comes from, then you can come up with new stuff. And I do pride myself on being quite a creative person. Um, and I think a lot of the creativity comes, goes back to, you know, a classic dish or a classic technique and then reworking it as well as, you know, other influences like awesome produce that you get here and, you know, color, which I'm, which I love. Um, so yeah, I've always been quite creative. Um, mum always grew a lot of, um, great produce, um, and we would make jams and trifles and things like that. So I, I don't think anyone thought that I was going to be a chef and I don't know where anyone anyone really thought it came from I know my grandmother was really creative and she was an awesome um cook um but really yeah I don't know where it came from it wasn't the most fashionable job when I was finishing school and um and everyone was sort of saying why why are you doing that like that sounds like a lot of hard work and um it, there was no sort of chefs on the toes before Jamie Oliver just before he sort of started so um, everyone was what everyone thought was mad, basically. <laughs> but I I would work some crazy hours. I I because they put me on the bakery once, and they said um, I remember my chef said to me, my pastry chef said to me, um, we're going to do the bakery tonight because I think the baker left or one of the bakers left, and he said he said we're going to do the bakery tonight. And unfortunately, this this chef he had. He had a bit of a drinking problem, this pastry chef. Um, he was a nice guy, but he, he liked going out a bit. And he said to me, right, I'll meet you here tonight at midnight and we'll do the bakery together. We'll, do, we'll make all the bread for all the banquets for the functions next day for, and all the croissants. So I got there at midday, uh, midnight and then I just started doing a few bits. Like there was a list there, but I didn't really know what I was doing. I was getting a few bits on and then, and then like half past one in the morning, he's phoning me from the pub or he just got home and he sounded like he'd had a few and he said, right, I'm going to, I'm going to talk you through it. And he, he basically talked me through the bakery. It was like kind of like one of the movies where, you know, that oh, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you how to bring the plane down. And I was like, right. Okay. <laughs> He's like, In the big mixing machine you need to put. And he, uh, I basically learned it as I went. Um, and I was stuck on the, bakery department for months after that and I was so slow that I used to get there and the, the baker would normally start at 1 a.m and he would finish at like uh, 9 a.m I would I would start at about 11 o'clock at night and I was still there till um, I'm not joking it was early afternoon it was it was like three o'clock because I'm trying to roll all my quest on for the next day and get all my stuff ready so that when I come in so by the time I'm on the train home and I'm, it's like f five o'clock, <laughs> I've fallen asleep and I would wake up at the end of the train line and it was like commute time. So everyone's going home from work and I would wake up like at the end of the train line and then try and get train back. I'll go home basically, have a shower, sleep, uh, get my chef whites on and I'd either go back to work and sleep in the locker room so I, I wouldn't be late. Or I just set my alarm for a couple of hours and then go back to work. And I did that for ages. And yeah, it was, but I loved it. <laughs> I, just, I was mad. I loved it. <laughs> I just thought it was brilliant. I thought, oh, I'm doing it. You know, I'm working in London. I'm doing, I'm doing it. And, you know. Well, what makes a great dessert? A great dessert. Oh, I don't know. It's really difficult with a great dessert because, um, you know, the classics are there for a reason. And if I had to go back and choose one of my favorite desserts of all time, you know, it'd be like a perfect lemon tart maybe, or uh, something simple. But um, I guess if you're constructing a dessert and you want it to be, um, um, you want it to be a bit of a standout, as long as it's in keeping with the previous dishes on the menu. So you need to make sure um, you're, you're constructing this dish uh, not on its own, not independently of the rest of the menu or the concept. Sorry. I'll wait. So you're not um, constructing this dish independent of the rest of the menu. Um, you need to kind of make sure. I always try and make sure there's um, a technique in there. Um, I always try to make sure there's contrast. So a contrast in temperature or a contrast and or a contrast in color, contrast in ingredients, um, contrast in uh, the way you make things. 
So lots of different contrasts, um, I think, make a really good, interesting dessert if you're working in a sort of fine dining restaurant. But if you're at home or you're cooking for someone that you love, then it's something, you know, that they want. <laughs> um, because if you listen to your customers or listen to who's who you're cooking for, then generally you're going to be more successful and have have a better outcome. Um, I spent a lot of years here creating some crazy desserts just because I could and because I was, you know, known for um, crazy, I guess, ingredient pairings and, you know, you know, I would be, I would be out there in terms of those things and I'd be trying to prove that I could do all these things. But I think where the, when I became more successful and my customers kept coming back regularly and I would sell more stuff is when I started to listen to them. And sometimes, you know, white chocolate and raspberry is a classic combination for a reason. Um, lemon, uh, lemon desserts are, are awesome. So I started um, toning down the experimental desserts. And once I'd hit on a dessert that was popular, I would keep it on. And all of a sudden, I've now filtered my menu and I've got to the point where I've got like the greatest hits of Birch and Purchase, you know, and a lot of them are classic combinations, but they're just done in, in my way. So um, so they kind of stay on the menu now because I can't take them off because every single flavor has got its little band of followers that they all they come down and they love and they, they really want, you know, that, that I'm known for it in their household. So I kind of can't take any off, but I can't add any more because I've got, you know, I've got so many different um, different uh, combinations or different products on the menu. So that's how, um, you know, that's how that I've, I've worked out what to make. So at the start, when you're young, you're trying all these new stuff and um, you think that trying to be really clever is – is the key to a successful dessert or a great dish. But I think as you get older, you kind of strip it back and then you realize that, you know, a great dish can just be an, an awesome bowl of raspberries, you know, the best raspberries you could possibly find. And that, you know, you know where they come from. They taste amazing. They're picked this morning and just a beautiful cream that's you know flavored with a little bit of vanilla and it's all sort of from your local area and it's all really great so that's a great dish as well as something that you know can take a pastry team of five to produce over a course of you know a day so i i'm kind of working out yeah simple is best um and i think just let the ingredients speak for themselves and cook what um what your customers want and or cook what your partner wants or your family wants um and then you'll be more successful. Is there something you've created during this time um, that sells really well that you're really proud of? Um, I'm just trying to think. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know, to be honest. Like, at, at the start, we were um, – I was trying anything, you know. I thought, well, people aren't going to want – you know, I've had to change my whole range basically this year um, because – as soon as lockdown started, people don't want large cakes because there was only a few of them in the household and I would only ever do sort of large cakes. So I was doing individual desserts. So I was uh, adapting my menu on the hoof basically all year um, and I would make some of my cakes sort of smaller. I've now come up with um, um, a new range, which is a kind, they're kind of like dessert pots. So they're my cakes – that come in 18 centimetre size and they come larger. They also come individual. They now come in a kind of two pot sharing size. And this has come about because um, the lockdown meant that, you know, we didn't have a lot of people coming through. So we, we jumped on another platform. So we, we were introduced to the Providor um, delivery platform by a friend of ours, Shane Delia, chef. Um, and he's, he's come up with this awesome, concept um which really has helped a tremendous amount of restaurants in melbourne sustain themselves throughout covid um and he he asked us to jump on board um he wanted you know a dessert partner to complement his suite of um awesome chefs and restaurants um so we put ourselves on the platform um 
And but we we you know we were getting some complaints about cakes. Uh, you know if, if they get shaken up, we pack really well here. We pride ourselves on our packing and our making sure that everything you know doesn't move in the box. Um, but um, there were some you know mishaps. You know delivery drivers kind of shaking stuff up. So I've had to come up with this entire range of almost travel proof desserts, um, which are kind of in my in my style. So. Um, I've come up with these pots and they've got lids. They're in biodegradable pots um, and basically all of my flavours are replicated and do, all the layers are in there still, but they're all designed to fit in these pots that, um, you know, if you shake them around a little bit, there's absolutely no drama. So I guess I'm really proud that we were able to um, be flexible enough to adapt our range throughout this period um, uh, and keep ourselves going because you can't you you just always got to be you know flexible enough to change the the ones that say oh this is my food this is how i do it i'm not i'm not changing it they're they're the ones that are gonna struggle in the future i think you've always got to be open to um being flexible and changing and you know you, you can't just sort of say no that's the way i'll do it because the world changes as we've seen you know the world's changed tremendously in the last twelve months, um, and you've got to, you've got to kind of be open your mind to be, um, you know, don't be stubborn. So I try not to be stubborn. I try and if someone wants something, then I will, and I, I more people ask for it. I think why why are they asking for it? You know, this must be something that people want then, and you know I'll look into it. And if it's something that I'm able to incorporate without, you know, making my menu too ridiculously large then i will but again my menu is now large because i don't make it every day i just i have the names i have the names of the dishes and you choose what you want and then we kind of make it to order using our um the, the system that we have here with you know components ready to go in you know either in the freezer or in the fridge you know we can construct dishes on the day so um it all comes down to being flexible and we are able to produce this um, massive menu, really, at the drop of a hat with a very small team um, because we're open to sort of new ideas, I think. So we're, we're all, we're, we're, Kath and I and my team here, we're, we pride ourselves on being, um, you know, uh, flexible and creative and not all sort of, you know, <laughs> into ourselves. That, no, this is what I do, so I'm not changing. You know, the customer can go away if they don't like what I make. You know, we I'm I'm quite happy to listen to whatever and you know, if a thousand people are queuing around the corner for something and they're not queuing for me, then you know, what what's that what's that lot doing over there that I'm not? So I'm I'm I've I'm not I'm not too um proud to, you know, look to look to other areas and um and I'm always trying to improve and I'm always trying to make sure I'm making stuff that um is going to keep customers coming back and keep our business going keep our team employed and also me feel correct creatively um yeah that's kind of me really you've made incredible changes to the business model um with um amazing yeah. benefits for that but how have you been personally this year has, has this experience changed you um i think yeah, it has it has changed me um, in that I, I'm I'm quite I don't know I'm trying to think the right words and um, I'm I'm really proud of the fact that we've been able to keep our team together and I've learned some things about my character in terms of resilience and um, optimism, trying to stay positive. Um, again, before this COVID hit, we were in such a tricky situation that um i guess a lot of the trauma and a lot of the pain and um uh the hard the hard stuff that i know other food operators have been going through this year i think i kind of feel like i went through that the year before or the year before that when the the construction thing next door which was is really impactful um was really um hard to take um, that when the COVID hit, I, it was kind of like, well, you know, I'm ready for it. So I think it, the changes in me personally this year are more 
and uh, I know we can. I can stay creative, and I, I'm going to stay optimistic, and I'm going to stay positive, and I'm going to try my hardest to um, adapt and be flexible and not be scared of change. So that stuff that that's been reinforced for me this year. But um, I guess in terms of you know being, I know mental health is a massive um, thing these days in um, employment. It was never spoken about when I first started. Um, sorry, just wait for that. Uh, me- mental health is a massive thing um, in workplace these days. It was never really um, discussed um, when I first started. Um, but I guess um, that's really important for everyone to work on. And we try and if I keep a positive environment and a creative environment and here, then hopefully um, myself, my wife and my team here will, you know, not have any any worries really i'm sure they've all got their own personal um worries in their own life but we try and keep work um positive and upbeat i, th- I think i've had depressive issues in the last couple of years more from that construction and my um a feeling that i really it was it was like helpless uh, there was nothing i could do about it i couldn't complain to the council they were overbearing they were um aggressive and they were destroying my business um and that was hard to get through and i kind of feel that this year like i I feel stronger as a person now and i felt stronger um um and i'm trying to convey that to everyone else and trying to um you know sort of say i bring discussions in the workplace you know about new stuff we're going to have that's going to happen in the business changes we're making we always have kind of a group discussion that say let's do this let's do that and I just try and bring a positive environment and then hopefully I can lead and help everyone um, and then you know we can all get through this and then hopefully 2021 is going to be awesome for everyone I know for us we've got some plans we want to potentially move out of this now redundant retail space which is where we've got we're paying retail. We're paying retail rent, but we don't let any customers in. Um, so we potentially move to a premises more suited to um, uh, where we want our business to go, and that and that's come about through making the changes this year from COVID. Well, Darren, uh, you're a bloody legend, mate, and it's inspiring to hear the changes that you've made and and such positivity. Um, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds. Uh, please keep in touch, and we'll talk again soon. Will do. I appreciate it. I'm sending lots of light and love out to everyone out there. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.